Good morning. I hope all of you had a wonderful Christmas. Pastor Randy is enjoying some time with his family this weekend. And my name is Valerie Wilson. I am a retired United Methodist pastor. My husband David and I moved here a year and a half ago to be close to our grandchildren and children uh, who live here in Charlotte. And we just love Charlotte. We are really enjoying Charlotte and we feel so blessed to be a part of this church. Please pray with me. Lord, let your Holy Spirit of wisdom and truth move around and through us as your word is proclaimed today. Amen. This morning, our lectionary gives us a text that is unique to the Gospel of Luke. Now, outside of the nativity stories found in Luke and Matthew, this is the only story in the New Testament we have about Jesus as a child. Now, we know that in the first century there were other stories, uh, primarily found in the Gospel of Thomas, but uh, the church fathers in their wisdom decided not to include that gospel in our New Testament canon. And so this is the only one we have. This particular story is about a journey that occurred when Jesus was 12 years old. Now, according to Luke, Mary and Joseph traveled every year to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. Nazareth, as you know, is up north in Galilee and is about 60 miles as the crow flies to Jerusalem, which is in the south. All Jews who were able to travel, especially the adult men, were expected to make this annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And from Luke, we gather that Mary, Joseph, and Jesus traveled with friends and family, probably from the Nazareth area, in a sort of a caravan to go down to Jerusalem. And, and they did this both for companionship and for safety. Now, if you look at a map, you could see that if you took a straight line down uh, south from Nazareth to, to uh, Judea, you have to pass through a region called Samaria. Well, they would have wanted to avoid that at all costs because that region was not friendly to Jews. And so instead, they would have headed due east, they would have gone through a valley that would take them to the Sea of Galilee. And then they would have gone down the western uh, coast of the sea until they reached the Jordan River. And then they would have followed the Jordan River all the way south. And there was an advantage to this because they would have access to fresh water as they camped every night uh, along their way south they would have uh, finally reached the oasis of Jericho. And it's really remarkable if you see Jericho from a distance, all around it is wilderness. Uh, this, and by wilderness, I mean bare, rocky hills uh, rising up above, uh, behind Jer uh, Jericho. But at Jericho, there's this, a date palm oasis and you have all of these beautiful green trees and it just pops out of the scene you know the, the scenery around it and they would have got from Jericho though they would have had to turn west again and they would have started up the Jericho to Jerusalem road and this was a very dangerous road because the wilderness had many caves this was where the bandits would hang out and they would attack uh, solitary travelers. So again, it was why they would travel in a caravan. But it was perhaps along this road, perhaps as they stopped for the night, that Jesus first heard the story of the Samaritan man who had helped a wounded Jew uh, and, and remembered that story uh, to tell us, you know, and his disciples today. As they neared Jerusalem, they would reach going up the mountain, um, 
they would pass through a town called Bethany, and they might stay with their friends Lazarus and Mary and Martha in that town. And that was only a few miles from Jerusalem itself. And they would reach the Mount of Olives, and there before them would be the capital city. They would be able to see the temple on the Temple Mount. Now, while they were in Jerusalem, remember this was a big festival, so the city would be packed with people. It literally more than doubled in population during these festivals. Mary and Joseph would have needed to do two things. The first, they would have visited the temple and they would have purchased some sort of small sacrifice, uh, some birds or, or perhaps a small animal to give to the priests and that was part of this festival. And then the other thing that they would do was with family and friends, they would have the Seder meal for the Passover, which tells the Passover story, the exodus of the slaves um, from Egypt, led by Moses. They would have stayed in Jerusalem or nearby at least through the Sabbath because they were not allowed to travel on the Sabbath. And it was only then, after the Sabbath was over, that they would start on their way home, their, their journey home. Now, obviously, they were traveling with a large group, and Mary and Joseph just assumed that Jesus was walking with his friends or perhaps some relatives from Nazareth, and they walked a whole day, and it wasn't until they stopped for that evening that they realized that Jesus was not with them. Have you ever misplaced a child? It happened to my son-in-law just last weekend, and I did warn him that I was gonna tell this story. <laughs> we were, uh, David and I were ringing the bell for the Salvation Army over at the Harris Teeter by South Park Mall, and the grandchildren came uh, to sing songs and, and really that it was wonderful because people heard them singing and they, they were just putting money in those buckets and it was great. <laughs> and uh, at the end of our shift, our six -year, the six-year-old grandson Davis decided he needed to use the restroom so he went into the Harris Teeter. And, and it wasn't five minutes later that Danny went in uh, and Davis was not in the restroom. It was the, the weekend before Christmas, that place was packed. I'd never seen so many people at a store before. And so Danny started looking around. He went back to the Salvation Army post there and was looking to see if he had returned to there. And no, he wasn't there. He went out to the car thinking maybe Davis had made his way to the car and he wasn't there. And um, David and I, meanwhile, we had left. We didn't realize any of this was going on. He went back in the store and he did find Davis. David ha Davis had decided to get a cookie. <laughs> Harris Teeter provides free cookies and Davis knew exactly where they were. But he was totally oblivious to his father's distress throughout all of that. But that story also reminded me of something that happened when I was a teenager. We lived in New Jersey, and uh, it was a summer, summer day, and the family decided we would go to the Jersey Shore uh, for a, a day at the beach. And it was hot and beautiful, and there were so many people there um, uh, at the beach, and we were enjoying ourselves until my mother said, where's Allison? Now, Allison is my baby sister, and at the time, she was maybe two and a half years old. And we looked around and we could not find her. And I can remember the look of utter panic on my parents' faces. And so all of us just spread out on the beach. We went in all different directions looking for this tiny redheaded toddler. I can easily imagine the panic that Mary and Joseph must have felt when they realized that Jesus was missing. 
And as soon as they realized it, they turned around and, and headed straight back to Jerusalem. What do you do in a situation like that? Well, first, you retrace your steps. You go every place that you had been, thinking that maybe the child would be there. You rack your brains thinking, where would this child go? And you try not to think about all the horrible things that could happen. Before I go any farther, I want to finish my story. We did find my sister. She had walked quite a ways down the beach and was hanging out with some fishermen who were also looking a little panicked at the thought of having, what should they do with this two-year-old, uh, lost two-year-old? But I can remember my mother crying with relief when we found her. Mary and Joseph searched for three days. They finally found Jesus in the temple, engrossed in conversation with his teachers, oblivious to the distress of his parents. Yes, I am sure that Mary and Joseph felt incredible relief. But according to Luke, they were also a little exasperated with their brilliant son. After all, he was 12 and he should have known better. And Mary says to him, why did you treat us like this? What were you thinking? Every parent who has had an adolescent has probably said those exact same words at some point. But there was also great joy because the lost child had been found. This is the first of Luke's lost and found stories. You know these stories. Jesus told the story of the shepherd who lost one sheep and left the 99 to, to search out that one lost lamb. And he told the story about the old woman who literally turned her house upside down, searching for her lost coin. And he told the story of the loving father who waited patiently for his prodigal son to return home to his family. I wonder if Jesus was remembering his own experience of being lost and found when he related those stories. I kind of think he did. But the difference in the stories is that though Mary and Joseph believed Jesus to be lost, he actually was exactly where he was supposed to be, in the house of the Lord. So what was Jesus doing there? Well, there's a coming of age ritual in the Jewish tradition called a bar mitzvah. Now for girls, it's called a bat mitzvah, but this is a modern convention and not something that took place in the first century. But the Jewish youngsters go to school and they learn to read and write and speak biblical Hebrew. And when they are 12 or 13, they present themselves at the synagogue to read from the Torah scrolls, the scripture that is assigned to that day, in front of the entire congregation. And they may also give a brief talk or answer questions about the meaning of the scripture that they read. Now, in Jesus' time, this presentation was a rite of passage marking the end of adolescence and the beginning of adulthood. I know, 12. It seems early, doesn't it? But afterwards, the youth would be permitted to join the adult men in the synagogue for worship and for studying the scriptures. It also meant increased responsibilities, both at home and in the larger community. And here, Jesus has taken the initiative to do this in the temple with the most learned scholars of the land. And Luke tells us that he made a very impressive presentation. When his parents find him, Jesus replies, 
did you not know that I must be in my father's house? He's not being flippant or disrespectful to his anxious parents. He is stating a fact. He has made a choice as an adult to put God first in his life, to make God a priority even over his biological family. It's a statement of faith, and it reveals his intimate, trusting, dependent relationship with God, who he called Abba, which really means daddy or papa. David and I were ret returning from a trip to Israel one time, and we were flying El Al, which is the Israeli airline, and behind us was a young Israeli couple with several small children. And all the way home, it's a long flight, 12 hours, all the way home, we heard those children saying, Abba, Abba. They were talking to their daddy. They were asking their daddy for things and, and expecting him to reply. And that's exactly the kind of relationship that Jesus wants his disciples to have with God. Like a child putting his or her complete trust in a parent who loves them unconditionally. Luke writes that Jesus returned home with his parent, parents and was obedient to them. Having announced that God would be his number one priority, Jesus would then follow all of God's commandments, including the one to honor his father and his mother. Jesus himself would later say that he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Luke ends his story by writing that Jesus grew in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. If you were listening to Teresa as she read the Old Testament lesson this morning, you might have noticed that these are almost the exact same words used to describe Samuel when he was a boy. Samuel had been dedicated to God by his mother Hannah. He had grown up in the household of Eli, the high priest who was in charge of the shrine at Shiloh. Samuel had his first encounter when he was just a young boy, in the Holy of Holies, no less. And he was charged by God to give Eli a prophetic message, to tell Eli that his sons, who were priests, had been abusing their powers and responsibilities. They had corrupted the office and that they would suffer the consequences. As a prophet of God, Samuel was a change agent in the history of God's people, initiating a new age of kings, anointing first Saul and then David as the first rulers of a united kingdom. And Jesus, too, would be God's most significant change agent in the history of God's people, initiating a new age called Christianity. And this morning's story transitions us from the baby Jesus of the nativity story to the one where Jesus is standing as an adult, willingly taking up the mantle as God's son, who will bring salvation for the whole world by the forgiveness of sin. As this year comes to a close, perhaps there are some of us who are hoping for some change in our lives. Some of you may have already written down some New Year's resolutions. What if we made a different resolution this year? Instead of worrying about diet and exercise, though the Lord knows I need to do both. <laughs> what if we resolved instead to grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with those around us? This story in Luke actually gives us some suggestions on how to do that. It is clear that Jesus immersed himself even as a child in the word of God. 
And I know that some of you read your Bibles from cover to cover every year. Bless you. You are an inspiration to all of us. But there's also some of you out there who would find that a little overwhelming. Let me suggest that rather than trying to do this on your own, you join a Bible study group. A group will keep you on track. It will hold you accountable so that by February, when you get into Deuteronomy, you don't give up. And I also find that a group study provides unique insights into the scriptures because when we study together, we bring our own life stories to the scriptures. And every time, it doesn't matter what, what we're studying, every time I learn something new, I get a new insight from somebody else when I study with a group. It's inspirational and it's encouraging. And we have many opportunities here at the church for doing group study. We have Sunday school classes, we have disciple Bible study, and I'm even gonna put another plug in for that lectionary study on Monday mornings at 10 a.m. We study the scriptures for the worship service coming up, and uh, it helps prepare us for worship. There's a second way to grow a deeper, more intimate relationship with God, and that is through obedience. It's not enough just to follow the Ten Commandments. And it's not easy to humble ourselves and submit to God's authority. But that is truly the way to experience the abundant life that God has promised for all of us. If you want change in your life, allow God to lead you. Allow God to transform you and allow God to use you. I pray that you will experience God's love in new and wonderful ways in the year ahead. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.